All right, with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Kayvon Harris is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he teaches sociology and economic development. He is the author of A Social Revolution, Politics and the Welfare State in Iran, which was recently published in 2017 by University of California Press. In 2016, Dr. Harris fielded the Iran Social Survey, one of the largest surveys of social relations in Iran since the 1979 revolution. Please welcome Dr. Kayvon Harris. Good evening, good evening. I will not be stamping your passport. But uh, now I know why some of you are here. So you finish your midterms, right? So many people had some midterms today, and now you're here to listen to a talk on your neighbor, the neighbor of Iran. So you're very lucky to be so close to Iran. And yet, how much do you know about Iran? Who, is, who has actually been to Iran? Anyone in the crowd? It's pretty good. It's 10%. Uh, in LA, many of us have been to Iran, because there's many Iranians in LA. And I've given a talk like this to Iranian before. Let me see if this is better. Yeah, I gave this talk to Iran before in LA, and they seem to like it, so, so we'll see. But um, this talk is based partly on the book I wrote that came out last year, but in Iran, things change fast. So at the end of the talk, I want to kind of bring the argument and the themes of the talk up to date. So bear with me as I take you from 1979 to the present, but maybe in a way that you're not used to when you hear uh, about the Islamic Republic of Iran. So this is the cover of my book. Um, I'm actually pretty happy with this cover. It's a woman's fist. This is actually, uh, but notice her nails. Her nails don't have any um, uh, fingernail polish, so she's not upper class. She's kind of a working class woman. She's wearing a uniform. This is actually a fist of a woman. I think she's a nurse or a teacher, and she's at a teacher's protest in Iran for higher wages. Kind of like the protests that have been going on in Iran over the last year. And uh, you can see actually behind her is some women. Um, and there's a very famous poster from Revolutionary Russia, which has very similar kind of aesthetics. So I was drawing on the idea that you know we can understand Iran in many different ways, but we can also understand Iran by looking at what's different and same, similar about Iran compared to other revolutions. So we'll talk a bit about that today. So first I want to go through maybe some, some facts, some data on social development in Iran since the revolution in 1979 that you may or may not be familiar with. If you've been there, you may understand a bit better, because you've never been there and just, you know, kind of seen a news reports or maybe watching a Iranian movie, you might not know some of the changes that have occurred. Then, I want to give you the puzzle of the book and my answer to the puzzle uh, about why the welfare system in Iran expanded the way it did after the revolution. And then, I want to bring some more recent research I've been conducting in Iran uh, from the Iran Social Survey to answer some more questions uh, that we might have about how Iranian politics and society are linked. And then lastly, I want to bring it up to date because over the last year, uh, things have been changing quite rapidly in Iran. And so the question is, of all these things I've been saying, how pertinent are they to the Iran of 2018 and the future? Okay, but first I want to show you some just trends, some very basic social development trends in Iran. So from before the revolution in 1979 and afterwards. And these are things that you may know, and many of you may have Iranian student friends here who came from Iran, or their parents are from Iran, maybe not. But these are some basic social indicators that, that actually are quite massive in terms of transformation. And the first one is, of course, the birth rate in Iran. So this is the birth rate of Iran, Turkey, and Egypt by color from 1960 to 2014. At the time of the revolution in 1979, Iran had a very high birth rate. The average family size was around six to seven. Um, at, in, by 2000, so meaning only about 20 years after the Iranian revolution, the birth rate of Iran fell to about two to two and a half, so what they call replacement rate. 
So within a generation, the family size shrank from the large family to the so-called nuclear family size. Um, faster than Egypt, actually. Here is, uh, that's the same thing. Birth rates, fertility rates, that's the same. Here is uh, indicators of what we would call basic primary health care. Immunization rates for the diseases that cause infant mortality uh, and child mortality. So this is DPT immunization rates from 1980, and Iran is the red, so in 1980 Iran was actually lower than other large Middle Eastern states such as Egypt and Turkey. And then by 1990, it caught up to those countries and then stayed very high. And you may or may not know, but during the 1980s, Iran fought an eight-year war with Iraq. So this was going on when they were fighting a major war with their neighbor, uh, Saddam Hussein. And yet, something was going on in the 1980s to change the healthcare system so that many new kids had access to primary health care. And I will talk about that today. Another example is measles immunization. It's the same trend. In 1980, Iran had relatively low measles vaccinations for children born in Iran. By 1990, it was up to about 100%. Child, and along with that came declines in child mortality. So uh, before the revolution, child mortality in Iran was declining. It was declining. And that trend continued in Iran after the revolution uh, up to the present to where child mortality in Iran is quite low. Uh, as, as, well, as, you know, as is the case in, in Turkey and Egypt to those countries credit as well. Here's something most of you probably know that uh, young women in Iran uh, end up highly educated. This is a basic trend in female youth literacy. So what percentage of young women in Iran are educated, uh, are literate? Before the revolution, it was about 40%. 40, 45% of young women in Iran were literate, knew how to read, um, so ages 15 to 24. Um, after the revolution, this rapidly expanded to where by the 1990s, if you were a woman in Iran, a young girl, you went to school. And almost everybody went to school. Your fathers let you, and it was required, your fathers let you go to school. Uh, this is higher education in Iran. So not just primary school and high school, but higher education. And in fact, um, the enrollment ratios in higher education uh, also went up and up and up and up to the point where by, let's see, only a couple of years ago, more, it was more likely that you were going to enter into tertiary education than not if you were of college age uh, in Iran. And for women and for men, there's not that much difference. In fact, in some majors, there's actually more women than men uh, in many universities in Iran. Right. So that's the social development indicator. So that's been some major changes in Iran over the last 35 years since the revolution. The other thing that's been happening in Iran is uh, the, the, the widening of what we could probably call the middle class. The term middle class is a pretty vague term. As a sociologist, I find the term sometimes useful, sometimes not. But in this case, let's just talk about the middle class as the people who aren't the richest and the people who aren't the poorest. So the middle income earners. So this is a graph about the deciles of income groups in Iran since the 1980s, uh, holding, the, uh, in, uh, holding the price constant. Um, and the, the red bars are the bars I want you to look at, meaning that the middle income earners in Iran started spending more and more and more, especially by the 2000s and 2010s. So the idea is that that, that group, not the, we're not the top 10%, and not the bottom, but the middle, actually got wealthier and was spending more over these years. So if you want to give one example of what, 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 it, what does it look like when you say there's a growing middle class in Iran, that's one way to, to measure it. Of course, it goes up to 2015, so we would probably imagine that that shrunk a bit over the last few years. Nevertheless, look, compared to the 1980s, there's been a huge jump and the amount of money spent by the middle groups of Iranian society. And then something like poverty, you know, which was a major problem at the time of the revolution, and for the first decade, 
uh, with the revolution during the war, she got worse. Uh, after the war ended in 1990, through you know, the 2000s, through some periods of economic growth, but as well as some of the social changes I was mentioning, poverty in Iran went down both in rural and urban areas. So these are poverty rates of $5 a day, not $2 a day, but a higher poverty line, measured $5 a day um, per person. This is the percentage of the population in these areas that are under that line. So I won't go into the lecture on poverty rates, but always know what line you're using. We're using a higher line here, $5 a day line. So, of course, you see right here, by the way, uh, 2014, 2015, they went up a bit. Uh, that's probably because of the sanctions, the effects of the sanctions. So we might see it going up a bit more now. Nevertheless, compared to the war years, 1980s, it's very different in Iran today. Okay, so, now, I don't need to tell you that there's a general argument out there that states, governments, that get most of their revenue from oil are supposedly supposed to be different than states that get most of their revenue from taxation. There's an argument which is very common, both in scholarship and just among journalists or politicians or intellectuals, that if states get their money from selling oil, the way that they interact with individuals in society is different. This has a lot of different terms used to, to describe this phenomenon. Uh, but one of them is uh, the cover of a book from one of my colleagues at UCLA. We're friends. But his book and my book differ a lot. And his book is called The Oil Curse. You ever heard this term? That oil is supposed to be a blessing, but actually it's a curse. And what does the oil curse say, this, this argument? It says that in modern states, let's say European states, with, with big social policy systems that are wealthy. The way the states gain revenue is by taxing individuals and taxing economic activity. And that's not just a one-way relationship. That when you tax someone, then you're obliged to provide something in return. So the government can't just tax you and then say, okay, thank you for the money. Supposedly that's a bargaining process over time. And that's, that's also that's a nexus of bargaining between state and society. And many have argued that through the taxation nexus, through the relationship of taxing, that's how Europe developed the modern welfare state, for example, the modern welfare system. Uh, that's actually often how many claim that that's how democracy came about in Europe. Many have argued this. And therefore, if that argument is true, states that do not tax and to get revenue from other sources don't have to provide social services and social welfare, and they do not have to be democracies. That's the other side of that argument. And there's been a lot of studies that have looked at how much of the population is taxed or what percentage of governments get their, rev get their revenue from oil, and they often run big statistical associations with indices of democracy, of social welfare, of gender outcomes, economic growth, and they find that there's a negative relationship. If states get more of their revenue from oil, then everything else is bad for those populations. Right? Nevertheless, there's a difference. Many of you might have taken a statistics class or maybe a research methods class, and we know in statistics that correlation does not mean causation. There we go. Okay? So that's pretty important. Uh, this scholarship generally doesn't go inside of the countries themselves and look at how oil money is used. Why does the state choose to put oil money here as opposed to there? Who decided that and why? When did that happen and what were the outcomes? Did anybody in society have a say about that? Right? So my problem with this argument is it's very abstract and up here. And as someone who had traveled a lot to Iran and lived in Iran, I started to realize that Iran doesn't look anything like this argument. Instead, Iran looks like this. I was living in Iran in 2008 and 2009, a long time ago by now. But at that time, just like today, there were lots of protests in Iran. Specifically in 2009, after uh, 
the election, uh, of the re-election of then President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And many people believe that he was fraudulently re-elected, went on the streets and protested. Uh, their preferred candidate is that guy's face right there, Mir Hossein Musavi. And I took that picture, and that's just one segment of this huge protest at the time that called themselves the Green Movement. That's what it was called at the time. So I was sitting there, I was watching all these people making demands against the, against the government, uh, having you know, kind of social movements, vibrant political discussions, critiques of the state. And these people were largely in those middle income groups that I had showed you earlier that had been growing over time. Well, the argument about the oil curse has a, another term that's often associated with it called the rentier state. Rent is often means uh, income garnered from an economic activity uh, that is sold because of a monopoly position. So it's not sold through market, but of a monopoly position. So if a state controls all of the oil sales in a country, which most modern states do that have oil, they garner rent. Uh, and they use that income as they would like. Uh, so the rentier state is supposed to have a different type of characteristic than a state that taxes and taxes economic activity. So rentier states don't need to bargain with their citizens. Instead, they use oil revenues to buy off parts of the population um, and kind of just control people. It's a pretty common argument, and it's an argument that did not explain Iran to me at all. Because if you go look at what the government of Iran spends the most money on in terms of education, health care, social insurance, it doesn't spend it on the poor. It's a big myth. It spends it on these people. And yet these people were the people who were in the streets protesting, right? So if welfare, social policy is supposed to act like a bribe, like if I give you this, you will have to stop demanding things from us, then it's a very bad bribe, because it doesn't work. At least it doesn't work in Iran. So most of the state welfare resources are going to the middle and upper classes, and yet there's high levels of political contestation. So, both electorally and in the streets. Uh, and the people who are engaging in this often tend to be in that middle social strata. So we have a puzzle here, a puzzle that the theory cannot explain. All right, so, so the question is, if the social policy system expanded after the revolution and, and became a system that includes all of these people, then how do we get there? Because the oil frontier thesis where the state just gets oil and gives to select people uh, that they decide to deserve it without any bargaining doesn't explain what I saw in Iran. So I had to figure out what were the historical pathways through which different groups of people went from not being connected to the state's welfare system to being connected. So we had to go look over history. Uh, and I think there are three main reasons I call them mechanisms, because that's what we call things in social science now. But three main reasons for why this expansion occurred, and why those trends I showed you in the beginning uh, are related to this. Okay, so these are the three I'm gonna talk about, and I'll show some pictures, tell some stories, um, and try to explain these mechanisms uh, well, in a fun way. So the first, is uh, what I call popular mobilization. All these different ways that revolutionary Iranian society involved people uh, mobilizing. The revolution itself was a huge mobilizational period. The war, wars involved mobilization, and elections in Iran also involved mobilization. I'm gonna put this water on the computer. There we go. Another is that um, there's a lot of competition, although politics in Iran is constrained and limited, not anybody can run for office, nevertheless, there is competition. That competition has an effect on people's access to social policy. And lastly, the general approach and the way that the political elite of the Islamic Republic saw the world and saw the, what they were supposed to do in relationship to the world, I call like an anti-systemic developmental outlook. And I'll explain what that means later on. 
Okay. So let's show a little picture in here. This is a cartoon from a satirical magazine printed in the early years of the Islamic Republic. And there's a student, and he looks pretty uh, comfortable with himself, probably because he's the guy who has the Kalashnikov, not his teacher. So we have a student, and we have a teacher. And the teacher is bowing a bit nervously uh, to the student. And the caption at the above says, in the new order, so the new post-revolutionary order, this, this teacher will be at the service of the student. Uh, and the principal will be at the service of the teacher. Um, and this is uh, an example of what was going on uh, in the revolutionary period. I call it the inversion of the status order. If you had a degree from a Western university, you, were, you, were, you became suspicious. You went from being respected to being suspicious. Because your value was not judged on your credentials any longer. It was judged on how committed you were to the revolution. It happens in any revolution, by the way. Are you revolutionary or are you not? Whose side are you on? So the value of your you know, role, your role, your status, became determined more by your relationship to the revolution than by the previous things that you had garnered. Um, and many people actually reinvented their biographies at the time uh, in the process to like, look more revolutionary. They dressed, they changed the way they dressed, they changed the way they uh, acted in public, more religious. Um, but this, what also was going on is it, it challenged authority from top to bottom in Iranian society. So it wasn't just about uh, religion, you know. Um, we think about the number of people who participated in the Iranian Revolution in 1978-79. It's probably, again, we don't have exact figures, but let's say anybody who participated in a protest or went out on the streets or maybe made a demand, it's probably at least about 10% of society at the time. Now that might sound small to you, but let's think about earlier revolutions. In the Russian Revolution, Russia was mostly peasantry in 1917, probably about 1% of society participated in the Russian Revolution. And yet, it's a famous revolution, shaped the 20th century. An order of magnitude higher of individuals participated in 1979, and it wasn't just in Tehran, it was all over the country. And it wasn't just uh, in the mosque, it was in the school, it was in the workplace, uh, it was in the village. Anybody who was your boss lost their authority. And you could establish authority over them by saying, I'm revolutionary and you're not. And that might sound scary, but at the time it was also exhilarating. And it created a whole new way of acting. It was a way of, of changing the world because you're committed to a new order. Now, there were lots of unintended consequences of this inversion of the status order. This is me, a bit younger, although I think I've lost weight since then. A bit younger, and, and I'm getting a tour of a health house. And a health house is a very simple idea that was not implemented widely around Iran until after the revolution. The idea existed before. There were pilot projects of the health house in the 1970s, but only after the revolution were health houses spread all around rural Iran that gave villagers access to basic primary health care, including those immunizations that I was showing earlier. This is a health worker showing me uh, a, a thing I'll show you later. And this is health houses in three very different provinces in Iran, the south, the very far north, the Sikh Caucasus, Khuzestan, right or very close to us, uh, and Isfahan. And uh, these, you know, the idea behind this came from uh, bureaucrats at the Ministry of Health who, for, for the whole 1970s, had been asking the previous government, the, the Pahlavi monarchy, to implement health houses as was going on in other third world countries at the time Cuba, China. Lots of countries had these kind of systems. And under the Pahlavi monarchy, it was tested as a pilot, but the Ministry of Health did not implement it fully. Well, the revolution took those guys out. And all of a sudden, these bureaucrats were like, now we're in charge. And we moved up, and it became revolutionary policy 
to implement health houses everywhere. And in fact, if you take a look, this is the percentage of individuals in rural Iran covered by health houses. So rural Iran. This is 1983, about 30%. And then you can see that the biggest uh, uptick is the 1980s, which are the years of the war, or the years of the war. So not only did the revolution create this kind of popular energy to, to reach out and include new people and link them to the revolution, but then the war happened. Of course, we know from wars that they're very mobilizing uh, events, especially when they last a long time. Two-week war, not very long. Eight-year war, it mobilizes people, uh, for better or for worse. And so even off of the front, the, the government reached out and tried to penetrate and dive into lots of new parts of Iranian society. And in rural Iran, this was one of them. We often call it the warfare welfare link. By the way, you know, the major expansions of, of healthcare, social insurance, and education in Europe came after the end of World War I and World War II. So this is not unique to Iran. This is a pretty common phenomenon. Countries fight wars, and then people are like, I'm fighting a war. What are you doing for me? And the state reaches out and gives things in return. And that has nothing to do with oil. It has nothing to do with taxation, by the way. So what was that woman, that health worker, showing me on the wall? She was showing me this. This is a, they call it the, the health wheel, information wheel. It's a very low cost, low tech way of linking uh, village life, which can be very different in different parts of the country, uh, to the central state, the central government. And of course, the problem is that governments have lots of policies. They want people to have less kids. They want you to you know, get, get vaccinations. They want you to eat less salt. But who, why would you ever believe what the government tells you to do? Why would you agree to that? Many countries try to lower birth rates in the 1970s and 80s. And some of them did it very coercively, like China. Some of them did it voluntarily, like Bangladesh. And some of them just totally failed. Bangladesh failed, actually. So, uh, one, there's a big problem in social policy, health policy, of getting people to change their behaviors. Because why would they do anything that the government tells them to do? There's no incentives. Well, these, this is an example of the way in which the Islamic Republic kind of was able to figure out what, was, what, was, what the problems were and what was changing in society and in the countryside. So in all these wheels, it's a list of who dies, who's born every year, what do they die of, um, uh, how big the village is. And it contains actually quite a bit of information. Every village is, um, fills one out in the health house, and it's centralized in the Department of Ministry of Health of Tehran. And then the government knows a bit better what, what, where are certain policies working and where are they not working? And it was through this information, this kind of bottom-up information gathering, that uh, the government was able to deal with uh, a problem that was hard to crack in Iran, which was maternal mortality. Infant mortality went down in Iran in the 80s and 90s, but maternal mortality is always more difficult to deal with when mothers will die, but the infants will survive. So through this wheel, they were able actually to reduce maternal mortality uh, in the 1990s quite well. But also, uh, you know, it was a way to establish a new relationship between countryside and the center. And so when the time came at the end of the war that the government realized that the birth rate in Iran was very high, and if the revolution was to produce a kind of new society, a society that was going to deliver the goods, not just spiritual, but material, then family sizes needed to be smaller. But like I said, Lots of governments have told had families to have less kids. Uh, but in Iran, uh, it worked. It worked. Iran went through the fastest decline in fertility rates uh, for any country in the 20th century. So it went in basically about 20 years. It went from high fertility to low fertility. It's faster than China, uh, and it's faster than many of the countries that, that went through a much slower process. I'm not saying the government is the only reason, but we do know that by the beginning of the 1990s, the government not only recommended, but gave all kinds of incentives to have less kids, not more. 
This is a sign outside of a school in Athwas, not too far away from here. That's where I was born, in Athwas. Uh, and it's, it's an older sign. It comes from the early 90s. And it says, yeah, you'll be happier with less children. Um, and of course, notice the sign is not directed towards the children. The sign is directed towards the parents. So it's telling you as a parent, you might want to have less children. Think about it. In fact, my favorite slogan is a slogan that Iran did not invent. They took this from public health campaigns in South Asia, but those weren't working in South Asia, but it worked in Iran. And my favorite slogan is, one is good, two is enough. It's a good slogan about it. Uh, so the, the new relationship between center and periphery, between state and society, formed a way in which people began to think differently about their own lives, and there were also incentives. And all of those, by the way, all those health clinics I visited, birth control is free. The contraception is available. Women can get pills, women can get uh, other types of contraception, and it's actually talked about, right? Encouraged, in many ways, uh, by the health workers. Okay, so, all these different forms, I would say, of, of, of mobilization are ways in which, uh, outside of this kind of oil, this oil uh, nexus, is ways in which different parts of the government were incentivized to reach out to new parts of society and link up with them. And social policy is one way to do that. It's one way to do that. Okay? But by the 90s, Iran entered into a, a new uh, kind of era in which elections became pretty important for Iranian politics. And elections had consequences. You know, people realized that who became president mattered uh, for their daily life, um, for the type of society they were living in, for where they thought Iran was going to go. And so, you know, Iranian elections are competitive, although constrained. Some are more competitive than others. But here is a picture, a couple of pictures from Iran in 2013 when I was there uh, voting. I voted in the elections in 2013 for president. On the left here is a taxi with all kinds of stickers of current president Hassan Rouhani plastered all over. Nobody paid this guy to put stickers up. He just decided, I'm going to put a bunch of stickers of Hassan Rouhani on my. I'm excited about the election. I'm mobilizing people in my cab to vote. Here's a picture on the right in downtown Tehran of another guy running for president at the time, the mayor of Tehran, uh, Andrei Kalibov, on the left. On the right is a picture that, as someone who lives in the United States, I would never see in a newspaper. A picture of Etel Khomeini voting. Have you ever seen a picture of Khomeini voting? I never seen one until I lived in Iran, and I guess he did. He probably did in every election. And that's showing, it's showing that even the leader of the revolution uh, voted, and you should too. And it's a way of mobilizing. And in these moments of elections, you know, Iranians get very mobilized. Every, all Iranians will say, I'm not voting. I'm not voting for any of these bums. These awful ones. I'm not voting for any of these guys. And then a week later, elections are the day. It's right around the corner. People are scrambling around to vote. It's a pretty common phenomenon in Iran. And then maybe two weeks later, they'll never admit it. But <laughs> Iranians vote in very high numbers, not like Baathist Syria, where people vote 99.9% for no, they vote 60, 70 percent, sometimes 80 percent turnout. It's pretty high uh, in Iranian elections, and it's real. It's real. So why is it so high? Why is it so high? Well, one of the weird things about the Iranian revolution is it's the only revolution, social revolution, revolution with lots of people participating in the 20th century that did not produce a one-party state. You might think that's not important, but every other revolution the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, the Zimbabwean Revolution, 1980, produced one-party states. One-party states are good, actually, for getting things done. They don't, it's not nice when they get it done, but they tend to get things done. And if the top says do something, the bottom tends to do it, or there's a new guy to replace the guy at the bottom. In Iran, there was actually a single party formed by anybody uh, allied with Ayatollah Khomeini from about 1980 to 1986, and it disbanded. 
And when it displayed that all of the politicians that had survived that revolutionary period, which was violent uh, and, and, and brutal, they survived that and the party they belonged to disbanded. And what happened is they ended up floating and turning into all of these different associations, uh, um, groups, but they did never form the type of parties which go all the way into society and have membership. Instead, there's no really, there's no institution in Iran that kind of disciplines politicians that all stay in line. So uh, you can get individuals who like say, they're here one year and they're like, I'm here over here and I'm starting my own party, party of one. And it's called this, 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 and I'm promising all these things. There's no one to discipline that person. And so you get lots of competition this way. You don't get a lot of things done, by the way, but you get a lot of competition. And that's what causes a lot of these electoral moments to actually look like uh, there's lots of options. So back to my question. What is the possible mechanism or reason for why social policy expands? Well, this is a uh, graph of the percentage of the labor force in Iran that's covered by the biggest social insurance organization in Iran, the Social Security Organization. And you got to remember also, from you know, the 60s into the 80s, the population was growing very fast. So this is just a percent of the labor force. So it's a lot more people entered the labor force in Iran. And yet, after elections, we tend to notice, at least some of them, that uh, there's a big ramp up in the state in reaching out and enrolling people into, uh, basically, at the time, it was a pretty generous social insurance program. It included health care for the whole family, pretty good pensions. Um, so I would say that, again, in lieu of oil and all these other things, one of the possible reasons for why people end up getting linked to these programs is because there's competition at the top, they want people to vote, uh, and then some new group gets in power, and then the system expands. Okay, so competition among the elite, I think, has been important for why individuals get enrolled uh, and, and joined up to the welfare system, the welfare state. But there's one more reason, and that's had a lot to do with the way that the political elite in the Islamic Republic see the rest of the world. They're pretty paranoid about it a lot of the time. Getting inside their head is sometimes difficult. But it's not just that they see conspiracies everywhere and everyone's out to get them. There's, everyone is out to get them once in a while. And what do you do when the world is trying to end your revolution? How do you deal with that? It's actually a question that all revolutions have to deal with. So the Union had to deal with it, uh, the Mao China had to deal with it, the Cubans had to deal with it, the Vietnamese, and the Iranians had to deal with it. So that guy I showed you at the beginning, Miriam Sam Musevi, his poster was there uh, during the Green Movement. He was prime minister in the 1980s. And he gave a speech near the end of his prime ministership. And the speech is very interesting. He's talking to the crowd in the parliament, many of whom hated him. They were competing against him. He was also talking to some of his supporters, who were radical supporters of Musavi at the time. And this was the speech he gave. He said that the problem for 10 years, meaning from 1979 to now, 89, this nation has lived for God. Of course, he would say that. It's the Islamic Republic, by definition, been living for God. He said, but the world is, is blind to our achievements, our piety, you know, the example we set for the world. So any revolution would say that. That's not the interesting thing. Then he says, whose problem is this? Is this our problem or the world's problem that they don't see how great we are? He says, whether we want it or not, we are in strong competition with the outside world. The world asks about our scientific, uh, economic, and cultural progress and gauges our ideology on that basis. Meaning that we're, the revolution will only be judged of success if we succeed on all these other factors. And then he said something very interesting. He said, even if there were no competition, it would be our duty to make this country the most prosperous in the world. Most prosperous, not middle income country, not a pious but poor country. Most prosperous, number one. Always number one. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, famously in the early 70s, the previous government, the head of the previous government in Iran, the Pahlavi monarchy, the head was Mohammad Reza Shah. 
a monarch, similar to uh, similar families on this side of the Gulf. He said something very famous. He said, I will take Iran to become the fifth industrial power in the United States, UK, France, Germany, and then Iran, number five. Musa, he's saying number one. He's like, we're going to be number one. Just to make the point there is that the drive for you know, regimes and political elites to promise that we're going we're gonna to shoot for the moon, our job is to develop the state, develop society, economic development, it's very common, especially for revolutionary states. And uh, there's a famous quote by Trotsky talking about the Russian Revolution that you know, if you do not modernize, you will perish. So the question for a revolutionary state is modernize or perish? Now how do you modernize in the 1990s? Well, you start to change the status order again. You start to bring in people in the government who are experts, or at least look like experts, or call themselves experts. So the middle here is the president of Iran in the early 90s, Hashim Rafsanjani. This is his cabinet. This was known as the cabinet of experts. Look how few clerics are in this cabinet. Most of the guys, and unfortunately still guys, but most of the guys standing around him have the Iranian version of the expert look. Their hair is cut a bit better, their beards are cleaner, and they have, you know, kind of chic suits, uh, very shiny, shiny suits. That means that they're experts. They have degrees in engineering, in economics, you know, and they wanted to show the cabinet of experts. What, do that, what, what, what do you need when you need experts? You need to produce experts, because a lot of the experts in Iran in 1979 were told, you don't matter anymore, and they left, or they changed their jobs. So you need to produce your own. Every revolution actually needs to produce its own cadres. In the Soviet Union, they had they called it the red experts. We needed red experts, but we needed them to be red. Uh, same with China. So in Iran, they had this problem, and so what do they do? They massively expanded the education system, they changed it, uh, and they started to produce a lot of experts. Um, this is the case of the University of Tehran, where many famous protests have occurred, both before and after the revolution. And you see in the bottom, that's a that's a currency that was, you know, um, it's still in circulation today. Not worth that much, but in the 90s, was a common. Currency, I think it was introduced in the 90s. It's got the gates of the university on it. Not just because it's a revolutionary symbol, but because education was now a revolutionary goal. And in fact, we can see in the data the number of education institutions at the time of the revolution, 220. By 2012, 2,500. See how much the value of education they're going to go home and study. 2,500. So basically, an order of magnitude expansion in educational institutions. And look at the percentage of individuals enrolled in these. Even in 1999, when there were famous student protests in Iran, it was still relatively small. Under Ahmadinejad, the quantity, maybe not the quality, but the quantity of educational institutions bloomed, ballooned. And lots of people in the countryside who never, their parents had never thought that they would be going to one of these educational institutions, their daughters and their sons went. What this did in Iran is it re-inverted the status order that had been flipped on its head in 1979. So in 1979, you won an argument by saying that you were more revolutionary than the next guy. 30 years later, you didn't always win the argument, but certainly you tried to make the argument that you knew the answer because you were an expert and the other guy was not. So that's a very different way of using your status. And look what happened. So society trans transformed and the political elite transformed. This is the education level of Iranian parliament members from the first Majlis to the mid-2000s. And you see here, at the time of the revolution, most parliament members had a high school degree, if that. It flips. By the mid-2000s, you have 25% of the Majlis that has a PhD. PhD. In fact, at that point, they passed a law saying that you have to have a master's degree just to be an MP. Did you know that? Did, what, by the way, you have a master's in the Kuwaiti parliament? No. 
What kind of revolution produces a law that says that you need a master's degree to be in the revolutionary majlis of the Islamic Republic? Only if you can explain the answer to that question do you get, do you get to understand the Iran. It doesn't explain everything, but it is interesting. All right. Look at the cat, well, until recently, some of these guys just got interpolated. But look at the cabinet, the first cabinet of Hassan Rouhani, 2013 to 2017. It's the same look as his old mentor, Hashmi Rasanjani. He's in the middle, he's the cleric, he's the mushta head, but he surrounded himself with dudes in suits with crisp beards. They're all a little bit older, it, you know, so they got a little wiser, but somebody put this, someone in the Iranian diaspora put this together, I did not. This was just floating around on the Iranian websites. Look at all the Western degrees that these guys got. That means that they're experts. They come from, they got to train in the West. Why, why would this matter? Why would this matter if the revolution was just about no. piety? It's because this anti-systemic, uh, meaning they thought that the, Sid, that the world order, the geopolitical order, was against them. The only way to survive was to, was to basically make our own experts. I'm not saying it worked. I'm just saying that that was the, that was the idea that they had. We still have this day. All right, so, so that produced a lot of educational expansion. You have all these people who, you know, all of a sudden are much more credentialed than their parents were in Iran. Everybody's going to college. It was cheap. It was available. Socially, what happened in Iran when everyone, when, when society was transformed? What were the politics of this transformation? Okay, so on the one hand, you have a lot of people who their lives are very different than their parents' lives. Maybe they grew up after the war had ended, and they kind of barely remember the war. And they were educated in the 1990s and 2000s. So they had what we call in sociology cultural capital. They had an education and credentials. They knew that they were the experts. They knew more better than their parents, and they probably knew better than some uh, much to have on TV telling them how to run the economy. So they thought they knew what they were doing. It just if they only could be in power, they would fix everything. Experts always believe that. Only we were in power, we would fix everything. But they couldn't, right? So a lot of the politics of the 90s and the 2000s, the everyday politics, came from this tension between a rising middle class that saw themselves as more knowledgeable, more credentialed, more expert than the political system itself, the political system which produced them. And so it caused a lot of friction. First, they started to really critique the state, not just as authoritarian, but as paternalistic. Telling me what to do. Telling me how to live my life. Telling me what I can wear. You're as bad as my father. My father tells me what I have to wear, and the government tells me what I have to wear. They're the same. Right? They're the same. So this, this, this discourse about the state being paternalistic was very important. Uh, in kind of reformist politics, in liberal politics in Iran. The discourse of corruption became much more important. It may not have been that actually Iran became any more corrupt at the time, but the fact that people were talking about corruption became very important. Already by the 90s, but obviously now, it's a huge, huge subject in Iranian everyday life. And of course, for sociologists, it means two things. It means that, yeah, maybe there is more corruption, at the top, or maybe every day. But it also means that people have a vision of a type of society in which there could be an alternative. So if everybody, if corruption is part of everyday life and nobody knows they can be different, you wouldn't be complaining about corruption. And now you're complaining because you have an idea that there's another way to do things. On the other hand, there's also the, the, the dividing line between those who deserve to get the benefits of sort of the social compact of the revolution, and those who do not deserve. We call this the deserving and the undeserving. That these are not real concepts, but people make decisions, saying this group is deserving of educational health, education, health care, etc., and this other group is not. And in fact, it became a critique that poor people in Iran get all this stuff from the government, and what do I get? Although maybe I got free tuition and health care, but I don't get anything. I got here through my own bootstraps 
Every middle class always says this in any country. Uh, and poor people in Iran, they're taking all the stuff from the state. So that discourse became important in Iranian politics. But also, uh, the political elite started to change the way that they claimed legitimacy. In the 2013 election in Iran, the candidates all had a bunch of debates on television. No candidate said anything about morality. No one said, go for me because I'm more moral than this guy. All of the claims were based on secular claims to legitimacy, such as economic growth, employment, development. So the po politicians themselves changed the way they appealed to society because of these big transformations in Iran. I'll give a couple examples of the tensions that come from this. Well, wait, wait, I can't read that. What did you say? Two minutes left? That's going to be longer than that. I have room for a lot longer. No one's leaving. Three people left, so we're fine. So everything starts to become commodified when you, when you get a society transforming like that. That's a good thing on the one hand. I can, you know, my parents don't get to tell me what to do. I can move to a city. You know, I can get a job. And my life changes because of that. On the other hand, how do you know you're different than the next person? How do you know you're better than the next person? It's not who your family is anymore. There's other ways to make yourself look more prestigious. We call this in sociology and social science status distinction. How do you show someone else who you've never met that you, you know, are an important person, that you're someone that they should take seriously? One of the ways you do it is through ideas. In Iran, there are many newspapers that are published every day. Even today, they're more expensive, but they're still published. They have huge, thick sections in the middle about philosophy. And I don't mean Islamic philosophy. I don't mean theft. I, don't, uh, I mean, like Hegel, Kant, fancy French philosophy I don't even like. They're written about it in the paper, a newspaper, not a magazine, the newspaper, every day. Every day there's, there's thick sections. And I'm talking about newspapers that thousands and thousands and thousands of people buy. I don't know if they read them, but they buy them. And the key is they buy them. Here's an interview with a famous British sociologist who had traveled to Iran a couple times, an interview I did with him in English. I put it up on my blog. A couple years later, the main reformist newspaper in Iran, Shag, translated it. They didn't ask me. That's the Iran for you. And they put it in their newspaper. Why would they even care? Who cares? Do people care. And I'm not saying they're doing this because they're actually interested. This is a sign of sophistication, a sign of intellectual sophistication. And all the newspapers are competing. Uh, saying that we're more sophisticated, we're translating these ideas. So the conspicuous consumption of ideas is part of the way in which the middle class in Iran asserted themselves. You know, these books get translated. You know, there's more books translated into Persian every year in a single country than translated into Arabic across the entire Middle East. I'm not saying Iranians read these books. I'm not saying that the translations are good. I read them, they're not good. But they go on the wall and people say, I have all of these French philosophers on my wall, because they're distinguishing themselves from each other. Also, in healthcare, you know, I mean, people wondering why, why is nose job such a huge thing in Iran? These are two advertisements for rhinoplasty in Iran. One is for men, one is for women. Uh, I like the man one. It's much more honest about what's going on. Um, but these are, these are uh, advertised all around. All around Iran. Why would we need to advertise rhinoplasty? Because actually, doctors are competing in Iran to, you know, I give the best nose jobs. No, I give the best nose jobs. And, you know, you may or may not know, and maybe that's a phenomenon here in Kuwait, but when men or women get nose jobs in Iran, they leave the bandage on their nose much longer than they need to. Why would you do that? Don't you want to just have the new nose? Just want to show the nose, and no one will ever know that you had a big nose. No, you want people to know that you had a nose job, because it's a way of showing that you have a high status. And it starts at the top of society, and it trickles all the way down. All right, I'll skip this. So, that was the story up until a couple years ago. I'm expanding social policy system, uh, Mobilization from above, as politicians try to get people on their side, and from below, as people both participate in elections and in protests. Um, 
that brought in people who had previously been excluded into this system. That's the mechanism. The uh, emphasis of the political elite on catching up with the West, on proving that the revolution was going to survive, made them obsessed with producing experts, and lots of people became educated through this expansion of the educational system. They turned around and became critics of that system, but they were produced through that system. They moved upward through that system. And then, what do you get? You get rising middle classes that think that they know everything, and the political elite which is competing all the time. You get lots of protests, surprises, electoral shifts, like Iranian politics had been from the, in the 90s and 2000s. Not only going, not always going on the side that some of us would like, but definitely creating surprises. Surprises. I haven't, by the way, mentioned oil at all. This whole story. It, it doesn't explain much. Anymore. All right. So, so let's just for the time let's put the sanctions and the and the and the the, the problems, the, some of the problems we run to the side. Say. These successes, if you want to call them successes, produce their own sets of problems. The problems that actually many other countries are facing in the world today. One problem is the problem of what we call over-credentialed, of over-credentialed individuals. It's good to have a college degree. You know, you read some books, you learn some fancy words, but when you get out of the labor market, sometimes that, that piece of paper can get you something, and sometimes it can't. And collectively, in Iran, as well as in many societies, Turkey, India, even China, uh, the mismatch between the labor market and the production of credentials is getting worse and worse and worse. And so Iran is an over-credentialed society given the labor market the way that it's structured. So just because you have a degree doesn't mean you're going to get a job. A job can answer to what you think you should have given that you're not smart and an expert. In fact, Iranians who are perennial will continue their education and get masters and PhDs and all these things. This makes the problem worse because the value of those degrees goes down in society, the value of being what you can get out of them. It's a global problem, but in Iran it's particularly bad uh, and, and it got worse because of it. It's an unintended consequence of the overproduction of credentials by giving everybody access to education. On the health and social side, I showed you all these figures about you know, declining infant mortality and um, reduction in family size. So Iran is not a society that's getting younger anymore. It's a society, a society that's getting older. All this stuff about Iran is youthful. I, I'm the age of the revolution. I'm not getting any younger. I'm getting older. Uh, and so I'm nothing, there's nothing youthful about me anymore at all. Um, and so the problems of Iran today are the problems of a society which is aging. And as opposed to living to, when you live to 35, the diseases you die from are very different than when you live to 75. And the cost of dealing with those diseases are different. They're much more expensive. So, for example, when I was in these health houses, I would ask the health workers, what were the diseases you saw when you started working here compared to the diseases you see now? And they were like, well, yeah, I started working here in 1986, and we had uh, you know, tuberculosis and cholera and diarrhea and those things. And now, we don't have any of those problems. We have diabetes, depression, um, hypertension, diseases of the elderly. These are very more, much more costly to deal with because they involve, you know, sort of secondary tertiary care. And, and like here in Kuwait, it's a much more expensive healthcare system that has to deal with these problems. Lastly, over credential population that people don't like the jobs that are available to them, and uh, a social policy system which was designed to deal with basic needs, not the, the needs of a kind of mature, complex society. How do you fix those problems? You cannot fix them by implementing decisions at the top and hoping that the solutions work. You have to get input from below. You have to get democratic input. Democratic in the sense of popular input, not elections, but real popular input. You have to understand what the problems of society are. So. I am skeptical that the system as it's set up now will be able to deal with these problems. Add on to this now what's been going on over the last year in Iran, where um, the reimposition of sanctions by the United States 
which is about to ramp up even more in the next week, to really reduce the revenue available to the state. And even if they're incompetent, more money at least thrown at the same set of problems would at least deal with some of them. Some of them. So let's say that they even knew what they were going to do next. The fact they have less money to do something about that makes it far less likely that these problems will be dealt with in the next 5, 10, 15 years. I'm not saying the sanctions will last that long, but I'll give you an example of some of the problems here. So the social contract, the revolutionary social contract, which meant more inclusivity, uh, more connection to the state, but also the unintended consequences of those processes is breaking down. Then the solutions to that breakdown are much more expensive and much more complex than the solutions that were available and were implemented in 1979. In 79. So in that sense, the fact that there are all these protests in Iran now, people are saying, that, like, what are you doing for me lately, government? Uh, oh, we wish I had a new set of guys in power. Like, this is also related to the fact that many people see themselves as being excluded again, or excluded whether their parents maybe were included. Or maybe they just see themselves as excluded, uh, and they never even thought about themselves as possibly being moving upwards like their parents had done. And so it's a real structural meaning, it's a real challenge, social challenge, not a challenge that individuals can solve, but a social challenge, a collective challenge for Iran to deal with these, uh, these issues. It's not just about what happened in the last year. It's not just about what happened because of an election. The deep challenges, and we shall see uh, if this government or another one can, can deal with them. So thank you for listening, Spain, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. We're going to open the floor to Q&A. The microphones are here and there. Um, does anybody have a question? Hi. Um, I have a question about your political renewal, a uh, point that you've made. Uh, you had mentioned that 60 to 80% of Iranians actually come out for voting. So my only question was, can you please expand on your on your point about democratic renewal. Uh, I said 60 to 80. Yeah. 60 to 80, not 6 to 8. I said 60 to 80, yeah. Oh, you said, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so 60 to 80 percent is the average turnout of elections. Yeah. So your question was, will that keep going on? Or will that will that matter? Or will it reduce? What's the, what, what's the question? No, no, I just wanted to know that one of the, um, one of the points that you mentioned was democratic participation. Yes. So if you have such a large population participating, yes. how does that factor into additional Well, good question. So one of the, what are the outcomes? One is that that stops happening and people stop voting and you get a kind of either, either collectively decided or just individually apathetic, move towards less voter turnout. And in those elections in the past where voter turnout has been lower, like more in the 60% range, that has largely favored the more conservative, dare I say, authoritarian segments of the political elite in Iran. So I would say that if that happens, that is bad for the way that the government will go. If it means stays high, that still doesn't mean that the more liberal democratic side will, will continue to be participating and win. It just means that the competition will probably there'll be still be there'll be you know people to compete for, uh, which could be good, which could be bad. Um, but they have to promise things. I mean, they have to promise things. They have to have a real agenda on, on either side of the debate, and and again, mobilize society to voting. And the problem is, you know, how many times can this go on? I, mean, I always wonder. Like, you know, people voted in 1997. It was a big election. Lots of people voted. And we're 18 then. They're 38 now. In 2005, there was a big election, lots of voting, you know, although some people sat it out. 2009, there was a big election. 2013, and all of these elections, people thought that this was the election that would solve most of my problems, you know? So, so there may, I don't know, I mean, we, all of us keep thinking that there should be election fatigue in Iran, uh, but it hasn't happened so far, so we'll see. But one of the possibilities is this, this, this era of high mass participation in Iranian society, this really product of the revolution that then opened up in the 90s, it might end. And Iran might look more like Egypt. Kind of the same guys in power at the top. It's just a joke. We just tell jokes about them instead of vote. Basically, the jokes are going to get better. So she's good for humor, bad for politics. 
Thank you very much for your presentation. Now, uh, you know in the States, when you go to the court, they ask you to say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? Now, uh, it was, uh, I think that presentation was a nice attempt to look at the positive stuff in, the, in Iran. But I'm sure you agree there are a lot of failures, right? You ended your presentation with the successes. Now, uh, so many of what you presented, like the number of books being uh, published in, the, in Iran, we need to understand what kind of books are published. Or if you, have, you need to have a master's to be a member of parliament, I think there is an or equivalent, right? Because if you're a graduate of Jose, then I think you're, you're probably equal to a master's degree holder. Still a credential. Still a credential. I was making point about quality. Would you have a question? Yes, yes, I, I have a question graduate. for you, yes. Okay. Uh, the question is, say we had not had that revolution in, in, in Iran in 1979, do you think these successes would have been there? Or do you, do you think there was a trend? Yeah. It's a good question, yeah. Thank you. So, just like the stock market, past trends can't predict future successes. What would Iran look like if the revolution hadn't happened? It's a great question, one that many people ask often. Well, we can look at other countries in the 1970s that were on similar trajectories, like Brazil, Mexico, um, South Africa. These are often compared in the 1970s to Iran as miracle economies that were growing at the rate that Iran was growing at. Those countries all had lost decades that they themselves called lost decades. Like, so we have our Nas Sukhte, well, in these countries, they have their last decades, too. The decades of low growth, war, not as volatile as Iran, although South Africa got quite volatile. And today, they're still middle-income countries. So, I just, you know, the only country that, the country that every, middle, every third world country wants to compare themselves to is South Korea. But South Korea is very different, started at a very different path. And if you're only comparing yourself to the one success, and not looking at the widest example, <laughs> of third world change, so from Brazil to Mexico to Indonesia to Thailand, countries that Iranians never compare themselves to, to Nigeria, to South Africa, to Zimbabwe, that's a better look at the range of possibilities in which Iran can go to Egypt. To Egypt. So there's a possibility Iran could look like Switzerland. It would be great. Dubai. Dubai is a city state, not a population of 80 million people. It would also be possible, by the way, there's something that Iranians don't like. No one compares themselves to countries poorer than them. That's like no middle class person compares themselves to the poor, they compare themselves to the rich. But Iran could be Egypt, you know. Egypt with a little bit more oil, but basically be like an aging dynastic state that no one's connected to, and would have a revolution anyway. So I don't know, I mean, it's easy to tell the story of Iran becoming France, very unrealistic, but the successes, and actually, in my book, I spent a whole chapter on the path of the monarchy and all of the good programs that they implemented, and how they don't get credit after the revolution, because revolutions devalue the previous regime. But so much of the social policy and the economic development programs, including the boasting about being number one, including the programs of agricultural modernization, which are now causing dust storms and water problems in Iran, those plans are the plans of the path of the monarchy which were put on hold and then re-implemented in the 1990s. So in that sense, the Islamic Republic is built on the foundations of the Pathway regime. Without the Pathway regime, you would have none of these successes at all. I agree with you. But you can't explain them by saying that it was just inertia. There are many countries that were doing well in the 70s and in the 80s went into tailspin. Iran is one of them in many ways, but on the social side of things, because of the revolution, I would argue that socially there was an increase in that process. Anyway, I wrote about it in the book. I, take, I actually talk about that stuff a lot uh, in the book. I mean, many, you know, I have many intellectual friends in Iran. We spend a lot of time complaining. Um, it's, but, you know, I think it's important to show where does the critique come from? I mean, why are all these people? You know, look at the number of people in university in Iran in 1979. We, the entire population was not Hoveda, with the carnation speaking French. That is a very misleading picture of the society as a whole. 
So, you know, I, I, my job is to be honest about what society looked like then, and how did it get from there to here? And that's, that's my, that was what the story I was telling was. We'll stop. Well, uh, thank you for your uh, very delightful speech, and I read your book, uh, and I enjoyed it. But, you know, we have to also be more realistic about Iran's uh, uh, revolution. I mean, there was a revolution unquestionably, a genuine revolution with a high participation in it. But, you know, uh, when the revolution took place, uh, there was really, you know, the, the Mr. Khomeini promised, <coughs> promised uh, uh, you know, an Islamic republic because that was in demand, you know, Islamic Republic. So they came up with a constitution which has so many flaws, which we are now beginning to admit. I mean, there is such a big problem with the constitution. What you said is very correct, that Iran probably has had more elections the last 40 years than any country in the world. I mean, I, I don't have the statistics, but they say the number of elections we have had has been immense. I don't have a count, but I know it's immense. But uh, look, it's an engineered election. You know, for one thing, you know, we have, you have 2,000 or more or 6,000 people uh, becoming candidates for uh, the presidential uh, you know, election, and only six can vote. Only six get agreed upon. I mean, they, the rest are filtered. They're wetted. You know what? So we have to look at the, the, the essence of that and what people are criticizing. Even now, the, the, num the large number of students who are unemployed, they're, 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 by the way, you talked about free and fair, uh, you know, welfare system. People have to pay for, for their education now. If you, even if you're in a high school or a secondary school, and I, my, my children grew up in Iran, if you want them to get a good education, you have to pay. It's not free education. I mean, yeah. this is, yeah. uh, you know, let's not, uh, you know, uh, tell ourselves what's not correct. They have to pay for it. You want to go to college, they have this Azad University where very unqualified people, Azad universities go and teach there, and they come out of it. Uh, they're not very well educated, but one thing that they have done, thanks to them, to the system, I mean the people in power, is that they have educated, at least provided minimal education to a large number of young people who are unemployed, who are now criticizing the system. And they are the ones whose parents went to war, whose parents were 100% supporting Mr. Khomeini or Mr. Khamenei, and now they have turned against the system. Why do we have so many demonstrations going on? Just turn on the news and just see how many demonstrations there are. The teachers are demonstrating, the bus drivers are demonstrating, the nurses are demonstrating. And this welfare system which you talked about, which is true, it, it was meant to serve and it did very good initially. Though it's a bankrupt system. I happen to carry one of those booklets which, which, which gives me free medical care, but nobody accepts it. No doctor accepts it, the, the drugstore doesn't accept it. It's absolutely worthless, and you should know that. I mean, for, you know, but, but fortunately, I mean, we have to be fair, you know, the, the Dr. Harris's book came out, came out a, a couple of years ago, by the time he did his research, he belongs to a little bit back. Things have changed in the last few years immensely, which of course is not in the book because the book came out before that. But uh, now, you know, everybody's calling for including people within the system, including people supporting Mr. Khamenei, who acts like Godfather. My God, you can, you know, uh, if you dare to go out and criticize him, the, 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 the revolutionary guards will pick you up. And will take you, why do you think I'm here? I mean, I should be teaching in Iran. I was a, a you know, I had a tenured position there. It's, it's absolutely, you know, it's impossible if you want to criticize you end up in jail. How many journalists are in prison right now? So the system is bankrupt, unquestionably bankrupt. It's tearing itself apart, but it has the revolutionary guards that have the guns. It is going to sustain itself unquestionably, that's my prediction, but it has to change. And people are now calling for a change in the referendum. They want a referendum. You know, this, this guy, the Supreme Leader, one, 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 yeah, the saw, and my question is, this, uh, the, do you think a referendum will be forthcoming or not? I mean, do you think that? Right. So, well, I, I agree with everything you said. I wasn't talking about the fairness of the politics. I wasn't talking about um, the, the, the declining utility, although I, I did actually talk about it, but you know, we, should, we can give the declining utility of those services over time. Um, and I certainly wasn't talking about uh, human rights and uh, 
oppression of intellectuals, students, and labor workers, you know, workers who, on paper, you know, in the Constitution, have a right to protest, but in reality, do not. So I actually don't disagree with anything you just said. I would be far more pessimistic than you are. You're not going to, you know, the most likely scenario is going to be a narrowing of the political lead at the top. Um, lower participation uh, in elections, uh, mass disillusionment, no revolution. You have to have an organization that have a revolution. There's no organization around that can do that. The security apparatus can back the state to the hilt, as many revolutions do. They go on, they go on a long time. Revolutions in states don't end because people get upset. It's not how the Soviet Union ended. The Soviet Union ended because it was an empire, and the elite society essentially ended themselves. But it doesn't work that way. So I, I can be far more honest about the, and pessimistic than you are. What's more likely is Iran becomes Egypt. And I'm not working with Egypt now, which is a kind of caricature, but Egypt under Mubarak, just like never gonna change, same guy in power, that his hair gets, as he gets older, his hair gets darker, and his glasses get bigger, right? That's what Iran, it's most likely will become that. Uh, and mass migration out of the country, and another lost uh, generation. I mean, that's, that's most likely what will happen. And sad, but again, I'm a historical sociologist. Look across the sweep of history. Look at the countries to compare Iran to. And I would say that it's not surprising that that, that probably is going to happen. And, you know, my, my approach is just how do we get from there to here? So the question is, does Iran look the same in 2016 when my book came out? Not today. Even, does Iran look today as Iran looked in 1979? Obviously it does not. So how do we get from there to here? That's one of the questions I was trying to talk about today. And in fact, Iranians themselves who live through this take it for granted. They don't, it's like a fish in water. A fish doesn't know that a fish is swimming in water. So a fish, all the fish sees is other fish say, how's the water? A fish doesn't understand. They're in water. Iranians who have gone through this transformation themselves critique other things. Why would they? Why would they even bring up the fact that these things happen to them? Of course, they would criticize human rights uh, violations, the lack of free elections, uh, the paternalistic side of the state. Of course, they would. I mean, I, you know that that is obvious. And by the way, there are about a hundred books about them. But I wrote this book not for the Iranian who lived through this process. Why would I tell an Iranian that they lived through it? They lived through it. This book is to let other people understand how they got from there to here. How they could uh, have so much power to make their demands. Not power to vic win victory, but the social power that you see on the streets of Iran do not become common because Iranians are special or somehow historically unique. This is an anti-essentialist, anti-exceptionalist account of Iran to compare it to other countries that aren't France, that aren't the UK, but to compare it to countries like itself, third world countries that all experienced huge social transformations in the last half of the 20th century, some equally, some more violent. And the worst thing you can tell an Iranian, and as an Iranian myself, I find it very insulting, that Iran is not the best or the worst country in the world on human rights, on this, but just in the middle. It's the most insulting thing you can say to a citizen of a country is that not the best or the worst, but just in the middle. It's like, what's, what's exciting about that? We're the worst country on corruption. We're the best country on Kubi Day, right? On, on, on our cuisine. So, you know, I'm, I'm being a comparativist as opposed to exceptionalist. Uh, I'm not, this book is not written for a person who lived through these transformations. As much as some of them might agree, but some of them might not. I think we have time for one more question. I want to offer it to uh, Nian, and then afterwards we can individually speak to the speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harris, uh, for this uh, beautiful uh, presentation. My question is, uh, you mentioned an intriguing fact about the requirement of a master's degree. Uh, or equivalent from the seminary. Or equivalent. Uh, it's a lot of reading. But I want to understand, what does it have to do with understanding the majlis at that time? Ah, well, my point there was that 
was that um, why would a you know why would a politically make a requirement for themselves, especially because many of their backgrounds come from critiquing the previous regime for being educated and disconnected from society? Why would a new revolutionary set of politicians then require themselves to have a standard credential degree to run for office? Uh, my point was that that as much as many of them didn't like it, the status order, meaning the value of credentials placed among people in society, not just them, but a lot of other people, had started to look again like it looked in the 1970s, and therefore that's how you proved to your opponent that you were the better politician, that you had a higher credential. So they, you know, they, 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 and in fact, in that sense, the transformations in society affected the political elite more than they like to admit. They were following not leading the changes in society. So that's, does that make sense? Okay. That's the best question I got because I can answer. I'd like to extend a big hey mamnoon to our speaker today. Thank you all for coming out. If you're here for uh, a stand, you can meet with Mohammed in the back. Um, and I encourage you all to keep coming to our talks and so on. We have a couple more in the future for this semester. Thank you all again for coming. <laughs>